Amen. Please be seated. Peggy? Inexplicable events occur, and with faith, a way emerges. Almost out of nowhere, where previously no way was present. From Exodus 14, 19 to 31. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite, Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall from them for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of life. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Thank you, Peggy. So we're going to expand on that story a little bit today, fill in some gaps that may have been there. But first we begin here. As people of faith, we know that there are times when we have to cross cross from shallow to deep waters to save ourselves or just to experience a more fulfilling life. Staying right here for a lifetime doesn't do much for us, right? We need to cross over like today's epic story of the Hebrew people who packed up everything they owned and followed Moses out of Egypt. What we don't hear in the scripture today, but, or at least in this piece of the reading, is the exit plan. They were hauling themselves and the relics of their lives in Egypt toward the Red Sea. We don't know exa- the exact route that they took to get there. Some think that they went right through the Red Sea and some think they they went through its northern tributaries where there was a little less water. What we do know is that the whole band of Hebrews did not go over land toward Canaan because that would have involved passing through six Egyptian military outposts and even with all of Moses' attempts to intimidate the Pharaoh, this little band of Hebrew slaves was no match for the military might of the Egyptian army. So they went instead toward the equally ludicrous option of crossing a sea as their route of escape, bravely following Moses with the Egyptian army in hot pursuit at some point in the lapping waves of the sea, spreading out a deep, dark blue barrier in front of them. 
And from there comes the story that most of us envision, the story that we heard in the scripture today, the story of how Moses stretched out his hand and the sea parted, how the entire band of Hebrews marched triumphantly through the sea on dry land and how Pharaoh's army was thwarted once and for all. That's the Hollywood version too. But I wonder how that compares to what must have been the depth of what was happening as the Egyptian, as the Israelites began their trek out of Egypt and before they got to the sea. If we really read that story, if we really try it on carefully, I don't know where, what word comes to mind for you, but for me, it would be terrifying. Because remember how we got there. The final plague had descended on Egypt, resulting in the deaths of the firstborn of every living thing in Egypt, including the Pharaoh's firstborn. Those Hebrews who followed God's direction and painted their doorposts with the blood of a lamb were spared this final plague, whose horror finally convinced the Pharaoh to let the people go. And he did. He told them to leave, to go to the place where their God expected them to go for worship, to get out of the land of Egypt and never come back. And then I wonder if Pharaoh got to thinking. Despite all that had happened, the seven plagues and all they had wrought, just as Pharaoh saw the dust of the Hebrews' carts and mules and feet disappearing into the Egyptian sun, I can almost hear him going, wait a minute, I've just now sent the backbone of the Egyptian economy away. I've let these slaves loose. What will we fall back on? How will we do that? He probably delivered those thoughts either in his head or through his voice in a little bit more emphatic tone than I have right now, but there you are. So what was his response? Pharaoh gathered together the full force of his army, horses and chariots and soldiers, and set out in pursuit of the Hebrews with the intent of destroying them, which kind of doesn't make sense if he really wanted to recover them as slaves, but I digress. Meanwhile, the people, lives stacked on the back of their donkeys, their children asking, are we there yet? plotted towards the unknown. They had gotten now as far as the Red Sea and were on its shore. The text explains their terror now, the water of the sea shimmering ominously in front of them, and they now hear the thundering force of the Egyptian army coming their way. Even with a pillar of cloud, you can't knock out all of the sounds and senses that must have been happening there. They were well and truly trapped between the Egyptian army and the sea, and if they stayed where they were, they would be slaughtered. This is our human nature, right? If they tried to go into the sea, of course, they would be drowned. So it appeared that the angel of death that obeyed and delayed, was, that was delayed by their blood-painted lintels in Egypt had now caught up to them. They didn't see where the next thing would happen. If they were to survive at all, they would have to do the seemingly impossible and cross the waters of the sea. And then complaining starts. I don't know. If I were complaining to Moses myself at that point, I would probably be begging for mercy as opposed to complaining, but there you have it. They looked ahead of them and saw the sea, and behind them they saw the Pharaoh, and then they started complaining to Moses, saying, Why did you bring me, all of us, out here to die in this way? What? The graves in Egypt weren't good enough for you? We told you to leave us alone, but no. And now here we are, about to be slaughtered. They complained because they didn't see freedom. All they could see and hear was what was around them. So thinking outside the box or the moment or whatever would have been unthinkable. Think of how we would be if we were sitting in that scenario. Their fight or flight reaction was reduced to the woulda, coulda, shoulda frame of reference that the shackles of slavery would have been better than this. And their fear of the sea was deeply held. 
Reverend Taylor Burton Edwards' Reflection C unpacks why this was likely so way back then. To get a sense of just how terrifying the prospect of crossing the Red Sea would have been to the Israelites, it's important to understand that the whole concept of the sea was fundamentally terrifying across the ancient Mediterranean world. Sea was chaos. Sea was unpredictable. Sea was home to monsters beneath the water, overwhelming waves on the water, and unpredictable and sometimes raging storms over the water that could capsize a fleet of ships in an instant. This is why the stories of sailors from ancient times were so often stories of heroes or even demigods. Only heroes would brave the wine-dark sea, and not all of them would survive. So under duress, with no clear path forward, and terrified, here the Israelites are, and it's no wonder then that in that moment in their humanness, the people could not find the crossing point in their minds and hearts from fear of where they were to faith within the, themselves and faith in God. Another way of envisioning where this caught up point is, this stuck point is, and hearing the despair and the terror and the fear that they might have been in, could be exemplified by a scene from the Shawshank Redemption. If you're not familiar with that movie, it's about a group of inmates in Shawshank Prison who learn that fear is the real jail warden in their lives. And early in that movie, we meet a character named Brooks, a character who's been a long time fixture at Shawshank. He is embodied as pretty gentle and also very practical, but he's been there for 50 years. And once he serves that 50-year sentence, he leaves the prison and begins life on the outside. In a particularly poignant scene in the movie, Brooks reads a letter that he's writing to his friends back at Shawshank, telling them about how life on the outside is for him. Dear fellas, I can't believe how fast things are moving on the outside. I saw an automobile once when I was a kid, but now they're everywhere. The world went and got itself in a big damn hurry. The parole board got me into this halfway house called the Brewer and a job bagging groceries at the Foodway. It's hard work and I try to keep up but my hands hurt most of the time. He would have been in his 70s. I don't think the store land manager likes me very much and sometimes I go to the park and feed the birds but I have trouble sleeping at night. I have bad dreams, like I'm falling. I wake up scared, and sometimes it takes me a while to remember where I am. Maybe I should go and get me a gun and rob the foodway so they'd send me back home to prison. I could shoot the manager while I was at it, sort of like a bonus, but I guess I'm really too old for that sort of nonsense anymore. Thing is, I don't like it here. I'm tired of being afraid all the time. I've decided not to stay. I doubt they'll kick up any fuss. Not for an old cook like me. That scene in the movie ends with Brooks committing suicide. The fear of his freedom was too much for him. Strangely enough, that one thing that he longed for for years, to be out of Shawshank, was so fear-infused that he couldn't bear it. On the outside, he learned the lessons the guys on the inside were still learning at the same time. No matter our circumstances, it's really fear that keeps us shackled, and that's where the Hebrews are. There they were, once again, out in the middle of nowhere, stuck between a huge army and a big sea that they were terrified of, and the thing that was keeping them from moving forward was fear, a fear so big and intimidating that even after years and years of slavery, they were actually suggesting that they return to Egypt. Not sure how that would have worked. Because the fear of what was ahead was so overwhelming and so unknown, it just seemed easier, more logical to fall back to the familiar, even if that meant a return to backbreaking work and misery and violence and oppression and likely a few, more than a few repercussions beyond imagining, given all that had preceded their leaving. 
And here stands Moses, listening to their ache, their fear, their fear showing up as complaining, a good leader. But he didn't really know for sure yet what was ahead either. All he knew was that God had led them this far. And as a leader, he didn't have any real choice except to, except to stand his ground. What was he going to say? He didn't know where they were going or how they'd get out of this particular situation, but he did know that turning around and going backwards was not an option. And then in the scripture and in Hollywood comes this piece. Moses lifts his arm and the water parts with momentous music swelling in the background in the movie. But we know that was not the case where all these people were. Instead, what they would have heard were the sounds of soldiers yelling and chariots creaking and horses' bridles jangling and dust in the air everywhere, along with their own children crying in terror and people yelling in confusion and no one really sure where to turn. And Moses, likely his own knees knocking and heart racing amidst the chaos, of the thundering armies, the screaming people, and the pounding waves responded in the only way he can think of. Surely inspired by God, don't be afraid. Stand firm and trust in God. The Lord will fight for you. Just be still and trust. Now, mind you, it's not an unreasonable request because God had been showing up in miraculous ways on the behalf of the Hebrew people for some time and was present there that day. God's return was, why are you asking me? Just tell the Israelites to move on. But it must have been so hard to be standing in this space to convince the people to step into the unknown when you're not really sure yourself, and to risk everything dear to them, to follow God, not just with their words, but with their lives. And God remained firm. I've laid it out for you as plainly as I can. What's go what, it's, what it's going to take from you now is facing up to the fear of putting one foot in front of the other and walking towards freedom. It was really then that Moses took God seriously, raised his hand, and the water of the sea began gently lapping outward. Before their fearful eyes, a path opened up in the very middle of the sea, ground dry enough to walk unencumbered, and all the people had to do was take a first step. The question really wasn't, will God bail us out, but will we have the courage to step out in faith in God? And so they did. To the eternal credit of the beleaguered Hebrew people, they swallowed their fear, lifted their feet, and walked straight into the middle of the sea. Sure, the path was there, but the text says that the water made a wall on their right and on their left. Can you imagine a path the size of our center aisle here and walls of water at least floor to ceiling on either side, close enough to touch? And that's what they're stepping into. Or so Hollywood would tell us. Regardless of what it looked like, every step must have taken courage and faith like they'd never had before. Each step a signal that faith and hope were bigger than the fear that held, held them back. So step, 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 one right after the other. Biting their lips, I'm sure, to contain their fear, they walked into the middle of the sea. <clears throat> There's a rabbinic midrash tale about this story that suggests that the waters did not in fact actually part with the sweep of Moses' hand and that the winds didn't begin to blow the waters apart until the people made those first steps. In the midrash tale, water in front of them, army behind God's invitation to move into their future, it was only when they tied up their robes and took off their sandals and actually waded into the water hip deep fear or no fear. It was then and only then that the waves picked up and the water receded and the path emerged. Regardless of how this all played out, we share and lean into this story of Hebrew people to illustrate with more drama than we'd ever want to experience in our own lives that a life of faith in God can still be paralyzingly terrifying. 
So what to do? In the hardest moments of our lives, there are decisions to be made, decisions about whether or not we will lift our feet and take our next step, even though we have no idea what's ahead or what it is that scares us. The letter to the Hebrews says that this is the essence of faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. We trust in God to guide us, and God expects us to believe with our feet, to take a step into the fear we hold and move into the promise he holds for everything our lives can be. Even so, when we encounter those big moments, we're inclined to back it up. We kind of like the past, the familiar surroundings, maintaining our comfort zones. Going forward is an overwhelming thing, so we tend to, towards keeping everything pretty much the same, and we tend to resist change in authority. And yet God keeps nudging us towards those next steps, right? Had the people of Israel done that, they would have surely perished at the hands of the army. And instead, at the end of their fateful crossing, the Hebrew people looked out over that huge expanse of water and saw Pharaoh's massive army destroyed and everything they loved safe and dry on the other side of the water and of slavery. God was faithful to them, but it took those steps, their steps, into the middle of the sea, their participation in the miraculous deliverance God had for them for God's promise and possibility to be seen and unfold. We all have seas to cross. Some are about starting a new job or at this time of year, beginning a new year in school. Others may be looking at retirement. Some may be moving out of their old uh, homestead and downsizing to a smaller space in an entirely different environment. Some are looking to overcome addiction and illness. There are so many obstacles, many uncharted waters ahead. I will offer that in my own life, a divorce in 1993, a major employment decision in 2004, and bankruptcy in 2008 were all like having the army on one side and the sea on the other at the time. All of them required me to step to places